Healthy Built Environment for Health Professionals training series. We are very excited today to be introducing Tom Lancaster from Metro Vancouver to deliver a presentation titled Healthy Neighborhood Design Outside the Health World. Welcome, Tom. I'll now pass the mic off to you. Thanks very much for the introduction and um, thanks for taking the time to go through this presentation. Uh, just as a little bit of context, I've been doing planning now for about 16 years um, to do with uh, this particular context. And the healthy built environment for me is um, another lens of looking at more sustainable um, and compact complete communities that are just better places for people. So the healthy built environment for me, and I think for a lot of people practicing now, is as much about um, creating spaces that, that uh, make healthier places for people to live, but it's, they're also age friendly, uh, they're much more walkable, they're uh, safer, they're places where children uh, and all the way up to seniors can get together, mingle, have fun together. They're just better places for us to live. The interesting thing about it is that we're getting a lot of political capital out of this because they're also cheaper to build. Uh, so the cost of infrastructure per person in, in places that we would consider a healthy built environment are actually much cheaper over the long term for uh, municipalities, local governments to maintain. So there's a lot of different entry points to the healthy built environment and, and I'm happy to have this opportunity to talk about these particular aspects of the healthy built environment. They relate, I think, to the practice uh, and, and as an entry point for a lot of health practitioners. So my presentation um, that, I, that uh, I'd like to go through uh, lists off uh, some of the tangibles, the things that people can really experience in the built environment that let them know they're in a particular kind of place. And what I mean by that is there are cues and clues out in the world that let you know you're in a walkable place or a place that's entirely not welcoming for pedestrians, that you're in a safe place or that you're in an unsafe place, that you're in a place that welcomes uh, the natural world in or you're in a place that pushes it out. And these are all cues that are really important things to pick up in during the planning and design processes. Now these are the opportunities for health practitioners to, to play a, a, a critical role in how cities develop, how neighborhoods develop, I think more importantly. Because these are the places where planners um, and designers need help in moving these kind of design principles and planning principles forward with their councils. So we can only do so much as planners and urban designers, uh, and even in, in the development community. What we need is councils and the, the political um, the political decision makers to get on board and support the, the kinds of projects that we're moving forward. So in, um, in this presentation, I want to walk you through a little bit about what uh, the healthy built environment is, is not, or what is not the healthy built environment. And then maybe turn the, the ship around and take a look at some examples of, of what it might look like. That'll set the stage for us to talk a bit more about um, the principles of good design and good planning and how you get there. Um, what it looks like and what it feels like and, and what I want you to do as you're walking through this is start thinking about some of the amazing places that you've been to in the world or if you've never traveled, just go to some place in your community where you can think, well, you know, I really like hanging out there, I like, um, you know, sitting on a park bench or I like walking through it, I like meeting with my friends or my, my family or it's a welcoming place. And if you have traveled, think about the places where you've gone where you've not been in a car, where uh, you've gone maybe to uh, a European city or some other city in Canada maybe that has a beautiful old historic downtown or some historic main streets. And we'll start to get into some of the, um, some of those aspects, the tangibles and the intangibles of the built environment that, that you can relate to when you're thinking about healthy built environment. The bigger picture about how we do this stuff. It's not just about uh, street design and the design on a block. It's about the bigger picture and the scale of the built environment and how we connect with where we live, with where we work, where we do access services, where we do our shopping, where we do our um, you know, playing, et cetera, et cetera. So context for this conversation is absolutely everything. You know, I've, I've worked on projects in the past as a, a development planner where people have asked for uh, compact, complete communities, this is quote unquote green or sustainable uh, community, but it's oftentimes not connected to the rest of the world. And what you end up with in these situations is a place out in the middle of nowhere that's great in and of itself, 
but requires people to get into cars to move to and from it. So as I cycle through some of the pictures in this thing, I want you to think about how that neighborhood that you're seeing a picture of is connected to anything or everything or nothing outside of that neighborhood. Uh, lastly, I want to get into the getting it built and the retrofitting because uh, really what we're doing is not talking about building new in Greenfield. What we're talking about, and sorry, Greenfield is um, areas that have not previously been developed uh, called non-urban areas or Greenfields. Uh, what we're looking at is really retrofitting what's already there. So you might have heard the concept of retrofitting suburbia. Uh, that's kind of a popular one out there right now. But really what it's doing is taking a look at what we've got and how we make it better because <laughs> there's so much bad stuff. And that's something I'm going to touch on next, which is this concept of bad monuments to sad logic. Uh, I know it's kind of a funny thing to look at. And this is obviously not uh, the picture you're seeing a, uh, a North American uh, <laughs> North American example. This is something from overseas. But what I'm trying to get at here is that we're, we're living now in um, about 65, 70 years of this car-oriented development pattern that you see depicted here. Now, the idea is that we build enough capacity to carry as many people in their cars as, as we possibly could imagine. And the more capacity you build, i.e. the bigger roads you build, the more cars are going to fill it up. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because like if you build, if you build a, a parkade and you build enough road space to get there, it'll get filled up. If you build a bigger parkade and bigger roads, the parking will still get filled up. The same concept, con concept goes for bridges. It goes for any kind of transportation infrastructure. So when we call these, these bad monuments um, uh, to sad logic, when we name them as, as these bad monuments to sad logic, what we're really referring to is this outmoded way of thinking that if we just build enough stuff, people will be able to get around. And if people can get around, then we build successful cities. Well, that is a very old way of thinking that dates back to you know post-war 1950s, early 1950s thinking, uh, and that's when the traffic and the road uh, engineering standards were amplified beyond anything that was remotely uh, human scale. So now what we're trying to do is roll that back and get back into what we're calling the human scale, human scaled environments. So the bad monuments are the, the cars, our car-oriented stuff, it's the roads. And the associated with the roads are obviously increased driving times, uh, but the speed and the parking. Uh, what they cause is a separation of uses. So you get residential separated from office, separated from uh, parking, separated from um, services, from shopping, from schools, from everything. And then every time you want to go and do something different than what you're doing at that particular second, you have to get into your car and drive to the next place because they're not walkable. And that's just the nature of what's happened, especially in North America, as we've been um, developing primarily in the last 65 years. We have these great city backbones, historic cities, all across North America, especially in Canada. Um, but none of them are really more than maybe 100, 140, 150 years old until you get into Quebec and, um, and, and some, of, uh, some of eastern Ontario. But in British Columbia, what we're doing is we're looking at primarily 130 years, 140 years of development with the majority of it happening in the last 65 years. And that is the time when cars dominated uh, pretty much everything. So the separation of uses um, really forces us to look at developing green fields. And green fields are the open spaces, the, the forests. A lot of the time here in BC, it's farmland. Um, and there's a whole world of associated issues with with uh, greenfield development. I'm going to touch on that, but not much. Uh, but in the end, what you end up is you're disconnected from pretty much everything. So here you see somebody trying to cross um, what looks like a seven-lane uh, cross-section of a street, but it doesn't feel like the kind of place you want to you want to walk. What I love about this picture is that there are people on this um, on the sidewalks, and I'm not sure where they're going. I don't even know if they're sure where they're going. Maybe they're looking for a, a bus that may or may not ever come. But generally, these are the type of environments where you've got road space, then a sidewalk where people are walking in a pretty barren uh, landscape, and then on the other side of them, um, there's a hydro right away, right there, some signs, and then more cars and parking. So this is the antithesis of what we're trying to achieve with the healthy built environment. What you end up with is, um, is a, not an urban form at all, it's a traffic form. 
And the, these kind of expressways and freeways and highways, that infrastructure is incredibly costly to build and maintain, and it only lasts for 75 years uh, until its useful life is complete. What we normally see is before then, even these things are getting knocked down and replaced with bigger and bigger and bigger. Because as we know, if you build a certain capacity, it'll get filled up. If you build a bigger capacity, that gets filled up too. It's called induced demand. <laughs> More examples. This is a funny one. I don't even know if this is real. I think somebody photoshopped it. I can't imagine a world um, where this exists. So this is a photo I took. Uh, you can you can see by the 97.9 um, uh, cents per liter there. That this is a, a couple of years old. But this is Okanagan, and this is one of those places where I, I stood here with my camera for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and waited for somebody to walk by. And there were the two uh, folks that were walking away there that I really wanted to capture. But it took almost an hour to get more than two people walking in this intersection. But this form that you're looking at is so typical of uh, British Columbia um, rural development, I would call it. Another version of that, the, the thing I like about this picture is almost a stark wall behind the Walmart leading into agricultural land. Uh, so obviously before there was Walmart, there was agricultural land. This is one of those funny ones that you see. It's a pattern uh, so typical with, um, especially in the Fraser Valley, but it's not just in the Fraser Valley. You see the roads actually ending at um, a field. So the, the road doesn't have a natural end. It's got the place where you're going to extend the road next into the next piece of farmland. So this is this is the perfect example of what sprawl looks like as it's happening. So the next thing that's going to come along is someone's going to exclude some land from the LR, and they're going to build another one of those exact same suburban developments that's separated from that arterial road um, on the extension of those, those secondary roads. So this is a, a famous uh, picture of suburban sprawl. And if you look at what it would what it would take to walk from one of the houses uh, in the central cul-de-sac there. Uh, just even to the road to the west of it, that is a good 20 minute walk. So that in and of itself would be great. And if you were trying to get people to walk more, you would build more stuff like this, except that people take their car if it looks like it's going to be more than a four minute walk. More examples of that form. Now what I was trying to get at with this picture is the um, this, this older 1960s, 1970s, um, just off the road mall form of development. And it's just cars, a small sidewalk, and more cars, and then and then the, um, the commercial units. What this offers, though, and what I'm getting at with this, is an opportunity to redevelop this. So these, these uses, they'll stay there for a long, long time because they actually generate a lot of rent. And it's hard to incentivize the redevelopment of this stuff once it's built because the rent on the, on the properties are actually quite high. So if you build this thing in 1970, you're actually looking at pretty much free money right now that's coming in. Things have been paid for for decades. Uh, the taxes on it are really low, and there's almost no upkeep. So it's, like I say, it's literally free money. What it does do is that there's enough space there that when eventually its useful life is complete, there's a redevelopment option. There's lots of room to redevelop. So your opportunities to retrofit stuff like this are actually really good. This, however, is another story. This is uh, like a parking lot typical to any big big box in BC. And um, th this is just primarily holding space for later on when you're going to build something else. The problem is that if you want to supply the parking for a Costco or a, a big box retailer like Costco, and you don't want to do it in this the acres of uh, on-grade parking, you have to go either above or below, both of which are extremely expensive um, options in places like uh, the Lower Mainland, it, it's anywhere from thirty to forty-five thousand dollars a stall to build underground parking. So you can see why this form is so predominant. So the, some of the health impacts of, of what we're doing. I mean, this is another topic that you've probably studied already, but these are the things that we look at in planning when we're bringing a, a concept forward to our councils to say. Look, there's health impacts associated with the development that you're looking at right now. Staff do not approve uh, of it if it's a you know suburban sprawl type development, and here here are the reasons why. Uh, generates air pollution. We right now are working on ways of quantifying the air pollution associated with different urban forms and different development types, and that's going to be a, a pretty big tool when we can have that for people. But the air pollution associated with different urban forms is a big thing that we bring forward. 
the accidents uh, associated with um, the travel time that's required for people who live in these uh, these, these um, suburban style developments that are disconnected from everything else are quite obvious and quantifiable through um, a number of different sources. Uh, you can go BCCA data, there's crash data, there are a lot of different ways where you can get um, a lot of different sources for data on that. The more intangible things are the loss of community identity and the uniqueness of the place you live. Now we know that there's psychological impacts on the people who live in places that are um, a fundamental sprawl style. So it's, it's a single family detached house, maybe 3,000, 4,000 square feet. Um, but it looks exactly like the house beside it. You've probably heard the ticky tacky um, uh, story. And if you haven't, just look up ticky tacky on uh, Google when you get a chance. But the house is made of ticky tacky. They all look the same. Um, there's an impact on the way people think and the way they see the world and the way they see other people around them. But it's more intangible. It's a harder story to tell. Uh, what they result in, though, is uh, lack of housing options. So if, if you were to build single family detached houses for everybody, our, our cities would take up all of the land that we have very quickly uh, because the per person requirement of land for that, not just in the house and in the property, but in the roads and the streets and the, and the parking associated with it are so demanding. So it results in a lack of housing choices and then because it's so impossible to, to uh, service low density neighborhoods with transit, you're, you end up having to drive everywhere you go. Uh, you can't even walk very far. You might be able to walk across the street to your neighbor, but you're not going to be able to walk to shopping. Uh, that also obviously leads to the lack of access to services and amenities unless you're driving to a centralized sort of shopping mall type experience. The uh, more tangible things that we are now getting into quantification, and there's lots of peer-reviewed work on this, the, uh, the lack of physical activity related to this urban form uh, or suburban form, I guess you could look at, and then the associated um, uh, issues uh, and illnesses, obesity, and associated cardiovascular disease with us. Uh, the social isol isolation is one that in planning we talk about a lot. And we see, we see uh, people being uh, removed from the experience of community, of, um, of working with your neighbors um, in, in a, a really positive way of uh, positive social interaction just by bumping into each other, say at the coffee shop or the, the butcher or the baker or the haberdasher or whatever. So the social isolation is actually a pretty serious issue, especially with the aging population. This is stuff that I'm sure people in the health um, uh, the health uh, industries are, are looking at much more closely than planners. And this is another opportunity for us to be sharing back and forth. So on to the good story. Uh, there's lots and lots of um, examples of good urban planning and design. I'll run you through a couple and I'll show you how to get there. So what do they do? So the, the principles are you put people first. So fundamentally you want to design places for people, not for cars. And I know that's kind of antithetical to, well, you know, several, many decades of thinking around that. But cars are second, if not third, if not fourth. The city of Vancouver, in their uh, transportation master plan, they have a hierarchy of uh, users of uh, of transportation modes. First is people, uh, second is cycling, and then it goes on down to the car at the very bottom. So people, pedestrians, um, cyclists, uh, non-motorized vehicles, all those kind of things are at the top of the hierarchy and that informs design. And once you put that up at the top of your, front, front and center of your mind, at the top of your design criteria list, you end up designing places more for people than for cars. So in these places, there's always stuff to do. You're never just wandering around with a blank wall, wondering what you're going to do, and you know you happen to bump into somebody once every 45 minutes as you're walking on the um, you know, sidewalk. There's always things to do. So you want to what's called animate the street front, and the street front in places like this are not the place where the cars are driving, but the other side where people are walking, and there's stuff to do along the side. So you can see above that commercial um, uh, street front. There's a couple of levels of, um, if not three levels or four, maybe there's the fourth setback of residential. And a lot of the time, these are um, these are older developments, um, and you can see by the street width, this is a, a relatively old street because we would have designed a much bigger street had it been built um, more recently. The interesting thing about the parking along the side here is that it actually uh, buffers the people on the sidewalk from the movement of the vehicle. 
uh, down the middle of that roadway. So the parking serves a purpose here. And the purpose is not just to park a car, but to give people a buffer from moving vehicles. There's always stuff to do. Uh, the interesting thing here, when I always talk about, uh, or when I talk about uh, economic development, I always talk about urban form. Because we're not talking about building, um, you know, the, the campus for the IT uh, development. What we're talking about is supporting local jobs with small retail units. We call them commercial retail units, CRUs. And those street front CRUs are generally small enough to allow small businesses to go in and then your rent um, per square foot is the same as other places, but overall your rent isn't that high. So it supports small businesses coming in and then it supports uh, small businesses that support local food production and then the chain of economic, local economic development continues from there. It makes safer places because as people are walking, there's lots of people around you and there's less chance for um, a dangerous encounter. If you do them right, they don't always end up in interesting places, but if you do them right, you can end up with the most interesting urban places possible. You get a diversity of uses, you get a diversity of people, and you get a diversity of uh, services and shops. And people can mingle happily and freely. Um, it ends up with a lot of uh, what we call um, incidental positive social interaction where you're just walking along, you have the opportunity to see something fun and comment on it, maybe even uh, see somebody you know uh, outside of the car and get a chance to sit down and talk to you. So getting into the principles, this is more of the nitty gritty, this is the, the how we do it. So when you look at something like this, this is uh, the, how the physical features of a place, the urban design qualities interact to give the individual reactions of the people that, that experience that place um, and it leads to overall walkability and then the big thing is the walking behavior. So a walkable neighborhood is one thing, but uh, inducing walking behaviors, positive walking behaviors is another thing. So walkability is related to um, densities and uh, the mix of uses and the diversity of, uh, of, of housing related to it, the diversity of transportation modes, but walking behavior is, is really an output of that related to the design of the place. So this is the intersection between the planning and the design. And they're two different things, although we, we need to roll them up into one parcel. So I'll walk you through this quickly with some examples. So in physical features, you want to look primarily, as a health uh, practitioner, when you're involved in any kind of planning exercise or when you're, when you're helping planners um, with, a, say, a letter of support uh, as they're taking an um, application through to their council, you want to look at the, the proposed sidewalk width. Now, this is an important one because there's different things that happen on the sidewalk. In this example, you can see there's three different things happen, four different things happening. So there's the person's private space, which is on the, the very right-hand edge of that, um, that oval, and there's a person standing there, and that's the edge of the private realm. But the private realm is not so divorced from the sidewalk that it actually serves as part of the sidewalk because people can interact freely and there's no, um, there's, no, there's no solid wall acting as a barrier. But the sidewalk width starts at where the uh, private realm ends there and you see the two people standing. That width right there between the private realm and the first uh, buffer, which is a landscape buffer, that's important. We need, uh, you're, you're looking somewhere between two and a half and three and a half meters is, is a nice uh, chunk of uh, uh, space. And I'll show you an example in a second of why you want something, you know, three meters is big, talk about 10 feet. But you do want something sizable to allow people to move past each other, to allow multiple people standing or walking together, to be able to continue walking together, especially with family or with friends. After the buffer, which is usually about a meter, a meter uh, 0.25 kind of thing for the landscape buffer, you can get into separated uses such as cycling, roller, rollerblading, um, skateboarding, all that kind of stuff. And in this instance, you're seeing a separated bike lane. So you got movement of two different people, or two different, two different modes moving in two different directions, and they are separated from, an, from one another by a small landscape buffer as well. Following that, there's another landscape buffer to the roadway itself. So sidewalk widths are really important. They're not the only thing, but they're very important. This is what I was mentioning before. You're going to want to have a pedestrian zone that's big enough to allow people of all mobility needs to move freely through that area. 
you know, it can't be too big because then you end up with what feels like walking down a freeway or if you're in a wheelchair rolling down a freeway. The example on the right, on the right is um, a, a visually impaired uh, pedestrian walking along and they need enough space to swing their, uh, their cane, uh, but not too much space if they're wandering without any kind of uh, uh, demarcation of, of where they are. So getting into the next uh, principle, sorry, getting into the next principle is the relationship between the street width and the building height. So street width in and of itself is not, um, there's no, there's no uh, ultimate way of determining street width, although once you get beyond about a four lane section of road, it, it starts to get, uh, uh, it, start, it starts to become an unfriendly place to be no matter what you do. But the relationship is what I want to get at here. So the building height on the sides of the road and the street width, what does that look like? So here you've got uh, a four lane section, but um, I think what we're saying is that there's two lanes of vehicle travel and then uh, a cycling lane on the right hand side and probably some parking on the side of the road sometimes. And a wide pedestrian realm, there's quite enough room there for people to move side by each. But then the height of the building is really important because what people experience when they're down on the ground is the, the stuff that's right at the, at the street wall. Remember we call it the street wall. And not so much the stuff that's behind it. But if you can see the other side of the road from one side, so take a look at the, at the right side of the picture, if you can see the top of the building on the other side of the road and it feels like it's towering or looming, that's going to make you feel like you're not welcome in that area because it's not um, focused on the pedestrian. You can design great places that look like this, but fundamentally it doesn't tell you that this is a pedestrian street. This is a street of buildings of primarily tall buildings. So you want to look at that relationship. If that road was narrower, it would give you a very different experience of, of walking or, uh, or of cycling in this area. If the road was much wider, it would feel a, a lot more open, um, and that's not necessarily a good thing. So you want to look at the, the relationship between those two things, and if you're talking to a designer or a planner, query them on this and say, what's the relationship between the building height at the street wall and the width of the road and what's happening? That, that affects what it feels like to be there. The tree canopy is, in my opinion, one of the more important things that you can end up with nice mature streets that feel like you want to be there. So the tree canopy should, um, should come up and end maybe halfway through the second story of uh, the buildings that are, that are adjacent to the road. So in these two examples, you can see this really nice canopy that frames the street. Uh, that frames the sidewalk, and it, it gives you an experience of, um, uh, of an, I'm going to get into it in a second, but it's called enclosure. Uh, it, it feels like a place you want to be. So it's protection, but it also frames the height and, and creates the feeling that this is a, um, a more pedestrian-friendly neighborhood than it otherwise would have been. So if you just strip those trees out of there, you can, you can kind of picture in your head, you've got a three or four-story street wall, and you know what that feels like. So trees do a lot. Obviously, you can't build a place with uh, fully mature trees, but you want to pick the tree species that are going to end up uh, with this type of enclosure. So, what is imageability? Um, and the next one you can see below that is enclosure. Those two things work together really um, closely. So, imageability means that you're in a place that is distinct from everywhere else. That when you think of it and you describe it to other people, they know immediately where you're talking about because it is so iconic and different. And this could take the, the shape of a number of different things. So in this example, you're looking at a, a very stark piece of architecture, but it's actually very warm and welcoming once you get into the open spaces. Uh, it's designed in such a way that it will mature over time with trees adjacent to it to create a very warm and welcoming place. But, but fundamentally, it's, it's a, a wow type of architecture. Other aspects of uh, enclosure are the relationship between street furniture, which is kind of a funny thing to say, but so look at the, um, look at the lighting. In, in the example of the lighting here, when I talk to engineers, they always find me and they want to say, you know, we need something that's about um, seven meters uh, off the ground for where the, light, uh, for where the light comes down. And I would say, well, no, you want to look at about three to four meters, three is a bit low, but four, three to three and a half to four and a half meters. And that relationship between that, um, the height of the tree canopy where it comes over, and then 
the actual canopies on the stores, on the storefronts, that relationship right there, you can see what it does is it creates almost a, uh, a feeling of a ceiling. But the ceiling is permeable so you can look right through it. But it, it creates a sense of enclosure and makes people feel safer. Um, not everybody suffers from agoraphobia, but this is the kind of thing where you feel like you're more in a comfortable place. And then other little things that, that are tricks of the trade, you hang those, um, those, those uh, iconic flags that tell you, you know, you're in a particular business improvement area. Um, and it gives a, a title to the place. It gives naming to the place. And you can say, hey, you know where I am right now is in um, a wonderful place to walk, but it's also called you know, whatever's on the flag. So enclosure is important. Transparency, and, and this is kind of one of those things that you see throughout uh, as a theme throughout all my slides, but as you're walking down the street, you want to be able to look not at a blank wall or a, a, a solid wall, but you want to be able to look through that wall and see human beings. It's a really critical thing. Uh, so the more diverse uses that, that uh, you can have and that transparency, um, the, the, the better it's going to be. So you don't want to just have cafes or you don't want to just have uh, uh, restaurants. You want to have a whole pile of different wacky things that people are going to be intrigued by as they're walking by. And it's going to make the, the walking experience more enjoyable. People will walk more and they'll walk happily much, much further distances. So the experience is so important. Imageability and complexity kind of go together. So complexity of the place you're, you're walking in, you want to feel like there's a new experience every 10 to 20 steps, depending on how big your steps are. But if you can create um, something iconic but that changes rapidly as you're walking through it, it's going to be a visual cue to lead you further down the sidewalk. So you're going to want to walk to the next thing that you see up ahead. So if you're looking up uh, maybe 40 or 50 or 60 feet, there should be a cue in there that pulls you forward, entices you to walk further. So that complexity is uh, what I mentioned before, the narrower, smaller uh, storefronts allow for more bizarre and interesting um, CRUs, commercial retail units. And when that happens, you can get some interesting things happening in the, the palm reader and the there's the tarot cards, but then there's also the, you know, the haberdasher, and then uh, some some odd little stores that um, that you know the curiosity stores that are really interesting places to go. So you want a complex urban route, and you don't get that by having massive storefronts where you know you get your sleep countries and your your bigger format retailers come in because they're pretty boring to walk by. Legibility uh, it talks briefly about knowing where you are. So the, the place is designed in such a way that it, it makes sense to you. There's clear directions, there's clear paths, the roadways are demarcated, there's a way to say, okay, this is where I'm supposed to walk because the, the paving stones in the area are designed to show you this is a pedestrian area and it's nice and wide. Um, the sidewalk is paved with red, um, the road is paved with, with just straight pavement, but in the area that's the pedestrian route, that's demarcated with either a different paver or a different application on top of that paver. There's lots of different things you can do that aren't that cost prohibitive anymore. But the signage is all um, unique to that area, and you can see that sense of enclosure again. But the legibility of, it, of this area tells you it's simple to navigate as a pedestrian. This is a photo I took when I was, uh, I think, in the uh, Czech Republic. And this is a really clear one. Although, although the road is used by pedestrians, cyclists, and cars at the same time, you can see the road itself is a very clear set of pavers that takes you through. And everything else is a, is a different color. The pavers are, are slightly different. And um, it, it demarcates the pedestrian area from the road in a very subtle way. But it's legible when you're there. Human scale, another thing that cuts through all of these themes, it's uh, a place that feels like it's built for people and not for cars. Here, it's human scale because there's people wandering all across the road. There's no cars at all. The linkages is a, a bit more difficult to describe with pictures, but what, what it is is different uses linked closely together and obviously through legible pathways that get you from one place to the next. And the experience is a positive experience. So you want to create linkages between places for people to hang out and gather and places for people to shop. 
So the linkage here, you can see in the foreground, there's a fountain, and then there's a set of uh, wires that are going uh, left to right in the screen. Well, you know what that's for. That's for a, uh, a transit line. So the linkage here is simple. It's people walking from the fountain where they're connected to some sort of transit that allows you to move um, in other directions. But you can see as people walk through this, this space, it's every use is linked to every other use. And the coherence of a place is, um, uh, let me just go back to another one to, to show you the difference. So the coherence of a place is that it doesn't need to be well designed. It just needs to make sense. So if you go back to legibility of a place, you can see that this place, um, this place makes sense. It's coherent. There's uh, a demarcation of uh, on that building across the way. The black um, facade is the commercial uses in the office right above it, and the white is uh, on top is the residential. And you can you can um, achieve this legibility and coherence with a number of different strategies. But with coherence, you want to make sense of the place. It needs to tell a story that it makes it look like there was a purpose behind it and that there's not just a bunch of things thrown together. So it's a really a difficult one to describe, but a very important one in, in design. So one of the, the principles of uh, land use, this is a much simpler thing to get through. You want a diverse mix of uses. Fundamentally, if you don't have a diverse mix of uses, it's going to be difficult to have a good place to design. So um, the, the principle here is have um, rental housing with market housing with a number of different uses at the street um, level. As a component of creating compact walkable neighborhoods, that diverse mix of uses uh, allows you to do the rest. So you, you can then make it compact because people don't need to drive as much. So with the compact and walkable neighborhoods, you have a diversity of uses, but then you've also got the design that plays into the concept of walkability. The compact component of that, it, it's, not, it's not so dense that it's, um, that it's uncomfortable, but compact means that you can walk easily from place to place. This is one of my favorite ones. This is a really old slide. Um, so these two images are the same scale, roughly. Uh, they both show roughly 1.6 uh, square kilometers. And the straight line, or there is no straight line, distance. The, the, the highlighted yellow distances from A to B are the shortest route, walking route or driving or whatever, to get from those two points, to get between those two points. And you can see on the left, there's this typical suburban form. That's a very long walking circuit. And like I said before, in and of itself, if people didn't have the option to drive, that would be great because they would have to then walk greater distances, which would feed into um, uh, greater cardiovascular health. But what you see is beyond four or five minute walk, people jump in the car. So in the more uh, block uh, oriented um, uh, example on the, on, the, uh, on the right side, you've got a more, more compact, denser form. It's typical of an older um, uh, planning and design way of thinking. And the, the walking distance is much shorter. So you put that together with good urban design and it fundamentally lets people it facilitates more walking. You need transportation options, and you need to service those things with efficient public transit. So whenever you're looking at a development application or a, uh, an official community plan that's being moved forward or a local area plan, you want to make sure that there's within the, 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 the area that's being, uh, the subject area that's being designed or planned, there's lots of transportation options. But you need to connect that area with other areas by a efficient public transit. Every place needs diverse housing choices. And this is this is a kind of an interesting concept because this is old but new. <laughs> so we think about your typical neighborhood where you grew up in, everyone's got a different experience of it. But there's different housing needs for different times in your life in every neighborhood. And uh, gone are the days where hopefully <laughs> gone are the days where we sequester the old folks off in the middle of nowhere in a gated community that is uh, removed from everything, and literally there's a gate around, so there's a fence around it with a gate. Um, we're looking at now reintroducing all sorts of different housing types into neighborhoods. So it's seamlessly integrated with uh, housing for young folks, uh, housing for young couples, even children, and then older folks in the neighborhood. It just uh, creates better places to live. Also, the diversity of housing choices 
creates more affordable neighborhoods. So when you look at the range of densities and the range of uh, housing typologies, it goes all the way from single-family detached, where you're at about six units per acre. This is a fairly complex slide, actually. Um, on the far left side, you get into detached houses, where uh, the densities are quite low. And as you move towards the right side, you can see all those different options that, that come out. Um, so from single detached to uh, semi-detached, all the way through to townhouse, row house, back townhouse, um, more dense apartment block style things all the way up into um, towers, your densities change as you move along that, that strata. So I'll leave this slide here for just for a second because um, there's so many different things that you need to accommodate in a neighborhood. And we failed in uh, the post 50s by building tower neighborhoods where all, all there are is towers. Uh, the towers in the park concept, I'm sure you've, you've heard of that before. But if you haven't, you can Google it and you'll see lots of great examples. The towers in the park are a great big huge tower separated by huge swaths of uh, green space where it might be a nice place to go and play if you're kids but you're not going to walk along that sidewalk. Um, so the redevelopment of existing areas, this is the infill piece. And wherever there's uh, areas, we call them gray fields or brown fields, where there was a use before, you want to build something new on that use to connect the, the neighborhood. So we see this all the time. Old gas stations on corners is a classic one. Uh, you'll go by a corner and there'll be a fence around it and there'll be a bunch of pipes sticking up out of the ground. And that's just a natural remediation way of dealing with an old gas station site. Well, often, that, that not often, almost always, that site would be better used as something other than a fenced off, uh, naturally rehabilitating old gas station site. As we develop neighborhoods, you absolutely have to maintain uh, the green spaces for um, a number of different reasons, for environmental functioning, for ecological functionality, Ecosystems actually provide a lot of services to us, but they also provide a psychological benefit to anybody uh, experiencing. So one of the critical um, functions of planning and, and design is not just around how we design a street, but how we design non-streets, how we design our parks, our parklets, and our, our green spaces, or how we just leave them, leave them be. As we get into the, the higher, the bigger scale, we want to look at uh, protecting and enhancing all of our agricultural lands uh, they do two things. One, they provide uh, a break from sprawl. They stop sprawl. It's called urban containment boundary. But it also provides food security. And as we move into uh, times where there's going to be a greater food insecurity, especially in our part of the world, we're going to need to preserve and have preserved those agricultural areas for future uses. Not only that, they provide a lot of benefit, economic benefit to our province. Going back to uh, fostering unique neighborhood identity, I'm not sure if you can recognize uh, some of these examples. A lot of these from the Kootenays. Um, and in my travels uh, doing um, community planning around, I've, I've taken a lot of examples, taken a lot of photos of these great little small town examples. Uh, other places, Toronto, the redevelopment of um, major urban centers is uh, another way of fostering something very unique to that place. An example, as I mentioned, the Kootenays. This is Kazo, an ant historic um, street, one of my favorites in First Columbia. And because Kazo doesn't have a big box sitting on the edge of town, this main street is actually a vibrant place to be, walk, and, and have a business. In my mind, a fantastic example of uh, a unique neighborhood identity in an old, old um, example of a main street. And then how do we do it? Well, this is one of the areas where uh, health practitioners need to be more involved. It's nurturing engaged citizens, getting people involved through innovative process of design, uh, interesting information that comes to meetings around uh, what we've talked about in this, um, in this presentation, how we build better communities, but also how people are part of that. And I know that we have a lot of problems with, um, with, with change. Human beings aren't that great at managing change. And this plays itself out in planning almost almost hourly, actually, we say daily. But with the NIMBY concept of we don't want change in our neighborhood, we want things to stay just the way they are. And uh, the, you know, as, as we know, the more things um, stay the same, the more they have to change. 
and you might not be interested in change, but change is definitely interested in you. Like there's so much in our psyches around around change that we, uh, both planners and health practitioners, need to be involved in managing that change to make sure that we're not just stuck in this old suburban style of um, of, of neighborhoods that are just divorced from everything else and require us to be carbs. This is one of the biggest problems that we have in planning, managing change in a positive way. Luckily, we have great processes that, and great people that um, we, can, we can engage people in taking charge of their neighborhood, taking charge of their community in a really positive way that welcomes change, that looks at welcoming different people, different uh, age groups, different uses, all that kind of stuff that just create better places to live. So in, in our practice, we try to design innovative process it's almost always around food and drink to get people involved in thinking about what they love about their community and what they would like to change. Without engaged citizens, though, we're really in a lot of trouble. <clears throat> so really quickly, the context of continuing development, making sure that we use what we've got before expanding. Now, maximizing existing infrastructure is one of the best ways to ensure that we have more compact, complete communities but that we have more affordable communities because the infrastructure is so expensive. And when you uh, use what you've got before expanding into, into new, new areas, you're looking at uh, more efficient use of what you've already got. So the per person or per capita amount of infrastructure is an important way of looking at compact communities. Urban containment boundaries, uh, like I mentioned before, we're drawing the line around the city and saying we're not allowing any development outside that line is a really um, effective way of doing this. The, the context of containing development, you have to look at the impact of sprawl when you're talking uh, at, a, at a high level around community planning. You have to look at, as a planner or as a health practitioner, bringing in the impacts to the conversation and saying to everybody, look, we have to look at the social and environmental and infrastructure and uh, local economic development impacts of sprawl when you're looking at analyzing a plan or a development application. And of course, location, location, location. Uh, so where you're doing this stuff is the most important thing. Leads me to my next um, slide, which is about greenfield development. You can design the most wonderful little compact, complete community, uh, but if it sits in a place that's divorced from the rest of the world, you're going to end up with um, problems of uh, traffic congestion. The people, you're never going to build a, a big enough place in and of itself to have everybody who lives there also work there, play there, and all that kind of stuff. Generally, these, these campus-style developments um, are very attractive places for people to live because then you can go and access the trees and the green spaces all around it, but what you've just done is taken away all the trees and green spaces around it um, to build this thing. And then the next thing happens where there's demand for more of this stuff and then you keep going and going and going. So this is a whole video series in and of itself, but suffice to say, greenfield development is something we need to stay away from. What it ends up in is these tracts of suburban style housing that I've discussed already. So in the, in the retrofitting, retrofitting conversation, it's much more difficult to retrofit this because it's relatively new. Uh, land value is quite low, um, but housing value is quite high. So you're not going to get into a situation of retrofitting this for many, many years. But these opportunities are so good. So, you know, the checks cashed place, the uh, money marts and all that kind of stuff that are the bane of, uh, of so many urban places. These are the kind of environments where as soon as you start to change so quickly, you go from a, an aggregate parking lot into this. This is the place where people are going to want to be. There's, a, there's a store or series of stores, but B, look at all the housing you just did. Um, the separating the people from any kind of parking behind it is critical. Oh, if you create a better sidewalk experience with a canopy of trees, create some enclosure there, it facilitates people being in that place. And then you get rid of <laughs> the checks cash place and you move into something that has some patio seating, a place for people to go, mix, mingle, uh, and have fun. That's what you're looking at doing. You can retrofit in different ways. So here we have a huge cross-section. What does this lend itself to? Well, the only thing it really lends itself to in the first stages is beautification. So you've got to throw a whole bunch of money at making it a more beautiful place. Following that, you'll get investment. And investment in the land can allow you to bring in different uses, 
identify the uses, allow for a diversity of those uses, and then bring people to the place. Without, uh, and this is you know over the course of maybe a 30-year cycle, without the transit, you're still back at a big, huge, sorry, back at a big, huge street um, with uh, a car orientation. Still, people in bikes aren't entirely welcome, but it's starting to get there. As soon as you um, add the transit piece to it, it it provides all the options in the world for making a better place to live. There's so many different options in this, and so many examples I could cycle through this for hours, but this is a fun one because it shows massive scale development, redevelopment, and all it takes is uh, reinvestment into these areas. Again, you see the the, uh, the wider road is narrowed, called putting this on a road diet. So you take away a lane of travel and you put a pedestrian bulge there, or we'll a bus bulge or whatever, and it decreases the amount of space that people have to walk across an intersection and it brings people to that area. It also allows for you to bring in different uses to that area um, where you'll have local uh, business opportunities and that in and of itself will bring more people to the place. So it's, you can see the beneficial uh, relationship between those two. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for sitting through and uh, it's been a pleasure.